This afternoon we want to talk for a little bit about Iditarod and dogs of the north. Iditarod, of course, being the most famous of the Alaskan sporting events, and we'll talk a little bit about the history, what's involved in that, um, and give you some idea of why it's such an extraordinary, they call it the last great race, and uh, just how very dangerous it, it actually is. Tomorrow morning, we will talk about Russia and the Americas, Seward's Folly, um, and then in the afternoon, we will talk about the Klondike Gold Rush, the, uh, both on the Canada side and in Alaska, the effort to try to, to take advantage of gold finds that they had there, so we'll get into that tomorrow. But uh, right now, I want to talk about the Iditarod and about dogs, and since we're going to be talking about dogs, I need to start with this. Um, <laughs> this is Jonah, this is Micah, they're our dogs. Um, and so, um, brother and sister. And so, just, you know, I'm talking about dogs. I had to show you a picture of my dogs. Um, we miss you. And because, yeah, we miss them. Because um, somebody has, was, we were, I was being asked earlier when I was talking about the um, dogs in reference to something else, well, when did dogs first show up? When did they occur in North America? The only thing we know for sure is that the very earliest account that we have of any people being coming across the Bering Strait Bridge and coming to the uh, North America, dogs were with them. We don't really have a whole lot more information than that. The oldest undisputed dog remains, which were buried next to people um, in North America, are 14,700 years ago. There's actually a disputed account um, version where uh, dog remains may have been as old as 36,000 years ago. The, um, the thing that a lot of us don't, I think, realize is that in North America, the dog was the only domesticated animal in North America prior to Christopher Columbus. There were no goats, no sheep, no cattle, no pigs, no horses. Dogs were the only domesticated animals, and they came across the Bering Strait land bridge with people. Um, we really don't have information about the, uh, as much as I'd like to keep my dogs up there, the, um, we don't have a lot of information about even how domestic dogs came to be. The only thing we really know about them is they are part of the wolf-like canids in terms of their origin. The most, they are the most widely spread of all terrestrial carnivores. There are more uh, types of dogs around the world than any other kind of carnivore. The closest relative to Canis familiaris, which is what the, uh, the domesticated dog is, is the gray wolf, which still exists. But there are many, many other kinds of wolves, both current and, and historically, uh, that are extinct now. But there's been no genetic relationship tied to any of those other, particularly more ancient wolf types and modern dogs. The gray wolf is the only real connection. The, there are other animals like coyotes and hyenas and other animals that are part of the uh, canid families, but the genetic link between dogs, uh, the domesticated dogs and them is very, very weak. The only thing we know for sure is that when people came into West Asia sometime um, 6,400 years and, and earlier ago, then they brought dogs with them. So that's the very best we can do. We don't know more than that. These are some ancient types of dogs, Myacid uh, Sinaticus uh, Tamarcus, and then Canis lupus is the wolf, and Canis familiaris is the modern dog. Related, but um, we're not exactly sure how the modern dog came to be. I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Iditarod race. Again, it's called the Last Great Race, and the, it, it is a dog sled race. If you're not familiar with the Iditarod, it's gotten so much international attention in the last 20 or 30 years, it'd be surprising if you haven't. Uh, the Iditarod, tra uh, Iditarod Trail Sled Dog Race begins in uh, March. It is a race by dog sled from Anchorage Anchorage is the show start. They don't actually begin the race at that point, but they do start there. From Anchorage to Nome, Alaska. It involves um, mushers. A musher is somebody who drives a dog sled team. Mushers with teams of 16 dogs, at least five of those dogs have to finish the race or they're disqualified. And the, the trip is right at 1,000 miles and it takes from 8 to 15 days for them to accomplish that. I'm going to go some, through some of the, the dangers involved. 
you'll notice that this, this says 1,049 miles. They always, uh, they, in publicity, they say 1,049 miles because uh, Alaska is the 49th state admitted. And so it's just part of their little promotional thing. But it's actually just under, there are two routes that they use in alternating years, and it's just under 1,000 miles each way. Uh, the Iditarod race was begun in 1973, uh, but it's evolved. It, the comp it's gotten better known. The competition has increased. Originally, it was intended, they began it um, even earlier, back in the 60s, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Canada, of the uh, United States buying Alaska from Russia. And they decided to have a race, and they collected a fairly large purse and got people involved in it. But then um, it sort of fell apart after the first year or so. And then in 1973, they reinstituted it. Um, the record race, and this is, again, right at 1,000 miles, the record is was just set last year by Mitch Savoy, and he's 57 years old, and he he's also the oldest winner ever because this is a young man's sport, if you can imagine. Um, he made he completed the race in eight days, three hours, 40 minutes, and 13 seconds. And you think, well, boy, they've got that down to a fine. There there was one time when the difference between first and second place was one second. Oh. Um, over an eight day plus period. And so they're very particular about making sure they got exact timing. There's a ceremonial start that begins in uh, Anchorage, as I said, but then they move to uh, Willow, Alaska, Willow Creek, and go from there. Originally, uh, they had started in the hometown of um, Sarah Palin. And so they, they would begin there, but then the snow has not been good there uh, for quite a long time. And so they begin in a different place now. The dangers of the Iditarod race, uh, the people who run it face whiteout blizzards, gale force winds, um, frozen rivers that may not be as frozen as you think they are, and sometimes a minus 100 or even up to a 130 degree minus uh, wind chill factor. So, uh, you know, it'll be 50 degrees below and then a 50 mile an hour wind and you end up with 100 to 130 uh, wind chill factor. So it's a very dangerous thing, but it is very popular in Alaska because it's seen as a symbolic link to the early history and a, a real connection to what was a historic way of communicating in uh, Alaska that is communicating from village to village. Before they had um, bush planes, before they had snowmobiles, um, because many of the northern ports would freeze in in the wintertime, the only real way to get from one place to another was by dog sled. Since the advent of bush pilots and uh, snowmobiles, dog sledding had declined sharply. But interestingly, since the, the Iditarod really caught on in the 1970s, it has become, uh, they, they've really increased the number of people who recreationally are doing dog sled uh, uh, events now in Alaska. This is the Iditarod Trail. It's a historic trail, the fourth historic trail in the United States ever to be named, and it's what the Iditarod uh, is named after, the race is named after. The, uh, you can see that down here is Seward, Alaska, that's where we're going to be in a, a day and a half. This is Anchorage here, and the, the Iditarod Trail, which is different than the Iditarod sled race, they do, they are the same in quite a few places, but the original Iditarod historic trail was from Seward up to Anchorage, and then there were other branches off of it. It comes up here to the town of Iditarod, which is now a ghost town. It was, a, it was an active town, an Athabascan a native town in earlier days during the gold rush, but then it was pretty much abandoned. But that was what gave the trail its name, and that what then, that's then what gave the race its name. It then goes up from there up to Norton Sound, around the north part of Norton Sound to Nome, Alaska. Now, this is all based upon uh, an historic event. The historic event was, uh, which is kind of the tradition that this is all based on, was a, an epidemic of diphtheria in 1925. And you can see right here, starting point of the 1925 diphtheria serum, dog sled relay route. What happened in 1925 is they had an outbreak of diphtheria in Nome up here. And they didn't have any serum. The serum they had was outdated, was not effective. And so they had to try to get serum up there. The ports were frozen in and it would have taken too long to get there by boat anyway. 
And so what they did, there was a train connection from down here in uh, Seward and Anchorage. They went by train up to Nananka, or Nanana, and that's the, as close as they could get. At that point, uh, the serum was taken by dog sled, and the dog sled, at that point, they traveled 674 miles, or 1,085 kilometers, from Nanana to Nome. It took them five and a half days to get there in order to stop this epidemic. The, um, the final leg was run by a Norwegian dog slaughter named Gunnar Kassen and his lead dog, Balto. Have you heard of Balto? Yes. There was a movie, an animated movie called Balto, which is based upon that historical event. There also uh, is a very popular statue in New York Central Park to Balto because they arrived in Nome on February 2nd, uh, 5.30 a.m. They delivered the serum. Uh, Nome was saved from this epidemic, and so Balto and uh, Gunnar Kassen became great heroes. Most of the mushers that were involved in most other dog slutters in Alaska really believed the hero was Leonard uh, Sapalat. If you get involved in reading anything about dog slutting, you will read the name Leonard uh, Sapala. He and his lead dog, Togo, uh, were the ones that carried the serum the furthest along the way, and they carried it 91 miles uh, across the most dangerous part of the course. And so a lot of people believe that that statue should be to Togo, but it was actually Balto who was the lead dog when they actually got it into Nome, and so they get credit for that. But it was this idea of a heroic rescue of the city of Nome from an epidemic using dog sleds became an important part of the tradition that kind of fed the Iditarod idea as they went along. This is the actual, um, the two roots, if you can see both of them here. They used to have only the, um, the northern route, which starts in Anchorage. It goes up here to, it, it used to start in Wasilla. That's Sarah Palin's hometown. But instead, because of lack, uh, lack of snow there, they've moved it actually a, a distance away. They go up, across, and then north here to Nome. But then the some of the towns up through here, uh, Athabascan and Inuit villages, were um, making great use of this. It became a major celebration. They enjoyed being part of the checkpoint stops. And so some of the other villages started saying, hey, what about us? So they decided a number of years ago to also have a southern route. And what they do now is on uh, even numbered years, they will run the northern route. On odd numbered years, they will run the southern route. It also has the advantage, the southern route, is that it runs through the namesake town of Iditarod that the whole thing was named after. Um, again, a little bit of the history in 1967, partly to honor um, Leonard Sapala, the guy that I just mentioned was considered the hero in 1925, they created a memorial race to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Alaska being uh, purchased. They started planning it in 67. Um, in the purse that year was $25,000 and they got 58 racers. They had just raised money to do this. It didn't get a lot of international publicity. The next year it was canceled because of lack of snow, so they lost the momentum. In 69, they had a very small purse, and they only had 12 uh, teams involved. But then it, it, declined, it nothing was done for several years. In 1973, um, a group of men got together and said, we're going to make this work, and we're going to extend it. Uh, the original race was shorter. They said, we're going to make it a 1,000-mile race. And they got um, donors to support it. They ended up having a $51,000 purse. They had 34 uh, racers. The next year, it had a lower purse, but they'd gotten a lot of publicity and more people participated. And then by 1975, they got corporate sponsors. They had got enough media attention that they got corporate sponsors for the thing and they sort of never looked back. It is now Alaska's biggest sporting event. And uh, the one of the problems that they've had is that they get so much international coverage on this thing now that some of the places that they, they stop there are no airfields, or if they are, they're tiny airfields, and they have a, a ton of media people who want to be able to fly ahead to the next location so that they can uh, be there when people show up. And that's become one of the biggest logistical problems they have, is taking care of the fact that this is now attracting so much international media. From time to time, they do have to uh, reroute the thing because of a lack of snow. Um, we're 
talked this morning about the fact that so many of the routes around the Arctic are now opening up because of the melting of the snow caps in, or the uh, ice caps in the polar region. Well, the same thing is happening with snow. They're not getting as much snow in some of these places, and so that's creating a problem for them. But they continue to run it every year. Uh, along the way, this is mile zero, 938 miles to Nome. Um, that's the, the race, Seward to um, uh, Seward, Alaska. The northern route has 26 checkpoints on it. The southern route has 27 checkpoints. As they run the race, uh, the mushers, the racers have to stop at every checkpoint. They have to sign in. Some of them will camp on the trail as they go along. Again, this takes five days. You, you have to stop somewhere, and the, the rules actually require it. There are three mandatory rest stops, primarily for the dogs. Um, there's one 24-hour layover that can be made at any checkpoint along the way. There's one eight-hour layover anywhere along the Yukon River leg, and then there's one eight-hour stop before at White River before the final sort of rush. The uh, mushers will, as I say, some of them will camp along the way, some of them will camp at the waypoints, the checkpoints. They will all send, they have it organized so that they send what's called drop bags ahead. They have the Iditarod Air Force, which are some bush pilots. They will transport <coughs> these drop bags that have food for the mushers and for the dogs, additional booties for the dogs because the dog's feet are protected by booties, headlamps, batteries, sled parts. Um, some mushers even have a lighter version of sled that they'll use in the last sort of sprint to get to the end of it. And so they'll have all of this stuff sent on ahead by the Iditarod Air Force. I love that idea that there's an Iditarod Air Force <laughs> that takes care of all that for them. Um, again, when they start out in March, they start out in downtown Anchorage on 4th Avenue in Anchorage. And the various, um, this is about the only place that there can be a lot of spectators. And so a lot of people show up, the media shows up for the launch of this thing. But the time between this and the, um, the restart, as they call it, which they now do in Willow Creek, is not added to people's um, time, overall time. So this is not an official start, it's just the ceremonial start. They'll start here, they travel about 20 miles to Eagle River where they unharness the dogs, load them up in the boxes that they have on you know, trucks and things, transport the dogs and the equipment um, to a, a place about 30 miles further on, and that's Willow Creek, again, used to be um, in Wasilla, and that's where they actually start the race. Before the race starts, they will draw numbers out for each of the uh, racers, and when they begin the ceremonial start, the based upon the numbers that were drawn, they will begin and have two minutes in between each racer. And so every two minutes a new racer will go so that the crowd gets to you know, cheer and that sort of thing. But again, that time before they get to Willow Creek does not get added to their overall time. It's just a ceremonial beginning uh, because they, many of the mushers say that they hate the part in the city because their dogs are not used to having a whole lot of people cheering and noise and all of that kind of thing. And some of them have had difficulties with their dogs for this. Others uh, don't seem to have as much problem, and so they, they seem to kind of enjoy it. The real race starts the next day, and you have to say, they look like they're having a great time. Um, <laughs> there, there have been accusations of uh, inhumanity to dogs on this race. Mm -hmm. There was a dog that died a few years ago, but they've instituted very strict kind of regulations now in terms of how the dogs are cared for. The dogs have to be arrested. The dogs are completely checked out physically by a veterinarian before the race starts. And at every checkpoint that they stop at, the, uh, they have volunteer veterinarians that will check the dogs out and make sure that, that their feet are in good shape, their joints are fine, their uh, respiration is good, that there's not any problem with it. At any point that's, that a musher decides that a dog, if, if they might get slightly injured, or seriously injured, I guess even, or if they um, seem to be tiring or they're not, they don't seem to have the energy for it, then they can pull that dog out. As long as they still have five of the original dogs when they get to the end of the a race, then they're fine. But um, the, when the race restarts, they separate them according to the same timing that they started out with. The first 100 miles out of Willow Creek is called Moose Alley. And it's a very dangerous area because wild moose uh, in the in the snow time, they like they'll get out on the trails that have been cut because it's easier for them to get around, 
And uh, they've had a number of instances where these moose have attacked dogs. Um, in 1985, one of the uh, most famous, a woman a musher who has won four races, she had a, coming into Moose Alley, she had a moose attack her dogs, killed two of the dogs, injured six more, before the next racer came up behind her who had a rifle in his sled and he ended up having to shoot the moose because the moose was in the process of trying to kill all the dogs. And so uh, there is real danger there. After they get past Moose Alley, before they get to the next checkpoint, they are on the side of a very steep uh, forest incline. And they've had a number of times where the sleds have slid off of that. They've lost control of them, uh, injuring mushers and sometimes dogs. So this is not, you know, a day out in the park. There are real dangers associated with this. Um, the next thing they do is they travel up a mountain ridge through a pass. The pass is 3,200 feet in height, and this is an area that's really prone to blizzards. In 1974, they had several cases of frostbite because this is one of the times when the temperature was minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind chill factor dropped into 130 uh, degrees minus, minus 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and uh, from 50 mile an hour winds. And so they had several cases of severe frostbite at, at that time. And in fact, it gets so bad in that area in terms of wind and blowing snow that it sometimes will obliterate the trail. It will obliterate the markers. There was a man named Norman Vaughn. He was a, formerly a colonel in the military. He had been involved in Richard Byrd's South Pole expedition as a dog sled um, leader. And so he knew what he was doing, but uh, in the, when he tried to do the Iditarod, the trail got obliterated, the markers were obliterated, covered with snow. He ended up being lost for five days in 1976 on the trail and almost died because he got off the trail and could not find his way back. So I guess what I'm trying to convey is that this, you know, this is not for the faint of heart. This really requires a expertise. Um, after they leave that mountain pass, they go downhill, um, it drops a thousand feet in just five miles, which makes it very hard to control the dog sleds. Um, there's very little traction. The Most of the time as they're going downhill, the dog sledders are having to ride the brakes and even throw hooks out to try to maintain some control uh, so that they don't end up uh, sliding down this mountain and basically running over the dogs with their sled. The next uh, stage is they run along the Tatina River and in the Tatina River, there's a danger of falling through thin ice. They cannot clearly evaluate always how thick the ice is. So they have had dogs fall through the ice, and then they reach a, a place along the Cuscoquam River where there is freezing water flowing over the ice. And so there's the concern, the dogs all wear booties you know, to protect their feet, but there's a danger of uh, freezing from that. Right after that, they go through an area called uh, Fallwell Burn, or I'm sorry, Farewell Burn, and at Farewell Burn, they had had a forest fire years ago. And so underneath the snow, which sometimes is fairly thin there, they have burnt trees and brush and sharp things. And it's not uncommon for dogs to injure their feet, even wearing booties, running across this stuff. Um, so quite extraordinary what they go through. As I mentioned, they run the northern route on even years, the southern route on odd, odd years, and in each case it gives the native um, Alaskan peoples an opportunity, many of the villages when they, as a checkpoint, that's their biggest celebration of the year now, is when Iditarod comes through, and they make a big deal out of it. They hold celebrations, including um, the on the southern route, they go through the ghost town of Iditarod, the namesake. Beyond. And the Iditarod is about, uh, the town of Iditarod is about midway. That's about the midpoint of the thing. So we're like three days into it at that point. At the midpoint, the wind chill factor often hits a hundred, minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And particularly after three days, many of the racers, you know, sleep very little. They, they try to, and so they start having, there are a couple of places that are kind of boring uh, at midpoint, and they're known to suffer hallucinations from sleep deprivation. So they have to deal with all of that as well. Um, this, this is an endurance race. There is very little to match it. The last stretch, which is a, usually seen as a sprint, is along the shores of Norton Sound around the Bering Sea. And it used to be, when they first started doing the race, because early, early on in the race, they would take 20 days. 
Now they do it in eight because it's gotten much more competitive and much more technologically advanced. The kinds of sleds they use, the training, they, the kinds of dogs they use, the training that they do has changed it a lot. The last stretch used to be kind of slow and easy, they kind of coasted in, but then as the competition got greater, this becomes an all out dash to try to get to the uh, end. The, all of the teams have to rest their dogs for eight hours at White Mountain before this last dash, since they know that that's going to be a, a very uh, difficult you know, push, a sprint in effect. Since 1991, um, the race has been decided by less than one hour difference on seven different occasions. It's been decided less than five minute difference on three occasions, and as I mentioned, 1978, there was a difference of one second uh, between the two number one and number two racers. So this last leg is very competitive. As I say, the first race back in 1973 took just over 20 days. They now do it in eight days, eight days and assorted hours. So uh, astonishing the difference that it makes. At the end of the event, everyone gets a brass belt buckle. <laughs> um, no, the, the, there are cash prizes for the top, uh, the top people, the winner and, and those who place. Everyone gets a um, brass belt buckle and a patch. They have a banquet, an awards banquet. There's a tradition that used to be when dog sledders were bringing, they knew a dog sled was coming to bring news or supplies because dog sleds before snowmobiles used to be used to bring everything from coal to uh, medicines to you name it, firewood. And when they knew that a sled was coming, they would always hang out a lantern. And so the tradition in Nome has always been, as they, before the people start coming in, they hang a lantern. And the, that marks the end of the Iditarod race. There's an archway there. And the last person to complete the race is called the Red Lantern because they're, you know, they're the last one that the lantern is still hanging for as people come across. And obviously with this level of, um, of difficulty, everyone is is respected if they complete this thing, uh, not just the people who win it, but there is a huge competition involved. There have been cases in recent years where uh, because of the competitive spirit, people have abused their dogs. And anytime anybody is caught either um, doping their dogs, giving them painkiller or in, any other, anything else, or trying to get away with a dog that's not healthy uh, because they, you know, they're still trying to drive, they get, they get thrown out of the Iditarod and are never allowed to compete again. And as I say, the veterinarians now, they really examine the dogs before the race, they check them at every checkpoint uh, to make sure that there, there are no obvious signs of a uh, problem. So yes, there are some people, some people abuse animals anyway, and so I'm sure you have that, but a lot of the people that do this race, they love the, their dogs, um, and, and I think they show that. And the dogs, this is what they live for. Originally, the earliest dogs that were used for this racing were Alaskan Malamutes that were bred by the Malamute people, um, which is one of the native tribes in the north, and they would tend to crossbreed these Malamutes with um, towns, setters, spaniels, German shepherds, wolves, almost anything to try to get size and strength out of the dogs. But in the early 1900s, they started bringing over from Russia the Siberian Husky, which is a slightly, uh, not quite as heavy a dog, but is, is uh, well known for having a great deal of stamina, a great deal of strength, um, and loving to run. I mean, they, they are now Siberian Huskies and sometimes Siberian Huskies crossed with some other kinds of dogs are really the only dogs that they look to because they have speed, they have tough feet, endurance, uh, good attitude, and they love to run. They love to run and pull the sleds. And so this is the kind of dog that's, that's usually used now rather than the heavier uh, Alaskan Malamute. So this is a little information about the most popular sporting event in Alaska. And uh, are there any questions? By the way, before I forget, oh, I forgot to put that up there. The uh, I'll, 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 tomorrow I'll make sure that you all get the list. Yes. That's correct. They start with 16. They have to have at least five, but they cannot replace them as they go along. And if a dog is injured or a dog um, isn't obviously is not going to be able to complete well, they will often load the dog on the sled and take the dog to the next checkpoint. And from the checkpoint, interestingly, they um, frequently will deliver the dogs. There's a penitentiary 
uh, near Nome. And they will take the dogs there because the uh, inmates at the penitentiary take care of the dogs and sort of rest them up and feed them and you know make sure that they're doing all right. I mean, there are veterinarians involved in this as well. But this, uh, they, they have a connection between the penitentiary and the dogs, and then their owners will pick them up later on once they finish the race. So, uh, but there's always veterinarian assistance along the way. I thought it was fascinating that they have, um, you know, penitentiary inmates take care of the dogs. There's a lot of work that's been done in recent years about the, the positive benefit of uh, inmates in penal institutions having pets and being able to, to have somebody, something to care for and, and so they've developed this as part of the Iditarod as well. Other questions, Pat? Um, have you read anything about the special diet that they require when they're running? The special diet they require when they're running. I know that the dogs, um, when they're running, they uh, burn over 9,000 calories a day, each dog. <laughs> And so they have to have a high caloric diet to support that. Also, their oxygen intake is two and a half times a marathon runner, um, the, the dogs in terms of, of the efficiency of their ability to burn oxygen. I don't know the specifics in terms of what's involved in the food, but I know it does have to be high caloric food in order to maintain them through, through all of that. Do you know more about that? No, I've read that primarily they used to use fish mm -hmm. and that um, dried kibble made their innards Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly what's involved. I know they obviously would have a lot of protein in it. They're carnivores, but they need something that will maintain that uh, energy level because you can imagine a dog, you know, that they average 45 pounds or so. Um, that and they have actually sometimes they'll have two two kinds of dogs. Some of the dogs they have are intended more for long distance, and they'll be lighter. Some of the dogs that they have will be sprinters, if you will. They'll, they'll put them in the lead when they're in their last section. But for the most part, the best of the dogs can do either one. And uh, to, to have a 45 pound or so dog burn over like 9,600 calories a day, you can imagine that you, you, these are extraordinary athletes and they have to be, have regard for that. Josette? How old are those What's that? How old are those studs? How old are the dogs? Well, they have to be in their prime. So I, I don't know at what point they retire them. It's probably, um, the dogs have to be trained to do this. So I, I'm guessing that they would not be able to use a dog that's less than like two years old, because depending upon the breed, some dogs don't really gain maturity until two. Uh, beyond that point, um, it would probably be up until the age in which the dog is no longer able to you know, maintain that level of activity or, or has the desire to. Uh, but I'm sure that that's probably decided on a on a case by case basis. Our dogs are two and a half, for instance, and the female, especially, still acts like a puppy sometimes. So, in terms of the discipline kind of thing that they do as as racers, um, they, they I'm sure that it would probably be they wouldn't run dogs before they're two years old, just based on my own experience with that. Other questions? Yes. How far apart is the actual start? The actual start? Yeah, how far apart are they supposed? Um, the it's based upon the timing they have when they when they come in like they leave two minutes apart and even though they don't add the time there still is an issue they go to the second checkpoint uh, which is at Eagle 20 miles away and they whatever their separation is when they reach Eagle that's the separation they give them when you know that they load at Eagle they load them up in trucks and they take the dogs to uh, Willow Creek but the timing difference that they had when they came into Willow, while it doesn't get added to their time, that does take it, take it into account in terms of when they get to start the next day. So uh, that's all a factor. And again, they don't all start at one time. You know, it's not like a, a, a race where you're 440 or something where they're all on the truck and the gun goes off and they all leave. They leave at certain times and that's logged and then they, you know, they count that time at each checkpoint when they sign in, they identify uh, their arrival and then their departure from each checkpoint and then they add all of that up in terms of when they finally cross the finish line. And that's why you could have two racers. It's not that, that we're one second apart. It's not like they're you know, trying to whip their dogs or something and get across before that other guy. Um, they don't even know until afterwards how they are, uh, how they've done against everybody else because they have to add up all the times. So, other questions? What's the slowest time? What's kind of the, the well, fastest? I mean, I realize that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, how, how long do they wait for that last yeah, person you know, to come in? 
Um, they nowadays they, they generally will say that the race takes between eight and fifteen days. Again, in 1973, the winter was 20 hours uh, or 20 days. I mean, but now they say um, that's eight to fifteen days, and so there's almost a week <coughs> period there where people will still be completing the race. But because they have checkpoints all along the way, um, they'll know when the last you know the, a, lot, a lot of people drop out. You know, you, at a certain point. If the dogs are not doing well, or a person gets sick, or they're injured, or something else, um, they do have an attrition rate. It's surprising to me how many of them actually finish the race, but uh, they do drop out, and they'll know that. For instance, they'll everybody will know in advance that this person coming across right now is the Red Lantern, is the last person to come across, uh, because they have communication. I'm sure there was a period of time in which they weren't able to do that, but now they do. So, anything else? Yes. Are they allowed a support team only insofar as they can they can send their drop bags ahead to various checkpoints and then when they get to those checkpoints there's support teams for everybody there are veterinarians there are others that take care of them so at the 26 or 27 depending on whether it's the northern or southern route they will have support at each station along the way um, but they uh, but again they have to run with the same dogs the same equipment they it's not like they can switch everything out, you know, change the tires on the dogs or anything like that. Um, they, they do have to continue, but they do have support at each checkpoint. I mean, they recognize that this is dangerous, and so they do have vets, uh, places to rest as you go along. Um, so that some people will stop at the checkpoints and rest there. Some people prefer to rest on the trail and then get going as soon after that, but there's three required rest stations that, that they have to stop at. So. Yes, just that. What is the average dogs, amount of dogs that finish the race? Um, how many average dogs finish the race? I don't know. I don't have a number on that. I, I know that it's not uncommon for, for a few dogs to, to drop out, um, but very seldom do they, do they fall down you know, to where it's a problem where they only have five dogs. Part of it is if they got down that far, it's very difficult for them to complete it anyway. So I don't know how many dogs drop out along the way. And as I say, I'm sure that there, there are some people who aren't good to their dogs, just like that's true everywhere. But for the most part, I think that they, they care about them. And so if they got down to the point where it was diff too difficult for, you know, eight dogs or ten dogs that were left to do it, they probably would, you know, hang it up. So thank you all very much. Tomorrow we'll come back with Russia in the Americas and with the Klondike Gold Rush. Have a good evening. <laughs>